Daniel Bora uh, is an artist living in Shelley, Idaho, which is near Idaho Falls in uh, eastern Idaho. I've known Daniel for better than 10 years. And uh, it's, it's been fun, Daniel, because during that time, I think I've seen your career really take off. Um, and it's, it's been kind of fun to watch. And uh, I already give, gave Daniel a heads up, but um, he's going to tell us a little bit about his art. And then um, hopefully we'll talk about some of his public art projects and how he got into public art. So Daniel, again, this is um, art appreciation students. So they're really excited to know um, what kind of material you work with you know, what your process is, and then, um, and then again, how'd you get into public art? Okay. Um, so, uh, I'm an artist, I'm a sculptor. Um, I, I do lots of different art, but sculpture is really what I've, uh, decided to focus on. So, um, I, you know, you know, it's always hard sometimes to say, well, what, what do I want to do? So at one point I thought I wanted to be a painter or a potter or a abstract sculptor, but I, I eventually narrowed it down to, to figurative sculpture. Um, sometimes I cast it in bronze, other times in, in, in fiberglass. Um, and sometimes I just do it in clay and fire it in a kiln. Um, but, but it's generally all figurative, uh, you know, uh, people, um, busts and, and bodies and things like that. Great. So, um, as, as I've been, uh, reconnecting with artists that I've met over the last few years, it's dawned on me when I'm introducing them that I don't always know how they refer to themselves, right? The kind of work they do. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. um, when I look at your work, I think, well, um, this artist is working with mass and volume, and they're a three-dimensional artist, but I don't know if you think of yourself as a clay artist, a ceramicist. Obviously, you think of yourself as a sculptor, right? A figurative yeah. sculptor? Yeah. yeah. So um, that conversation comes up a lot in class, the, the uh, conversation of categories and how these things tend to be fluid. And I don't think there's a list I could give students that would ever capture all of the uh, the ways that artists conceive of themselves. So yeah, yeah, for sure. I could I could have described myself as a, a public artist, or or even a teacher. I do a lot of teaching. Um, I mean, there there there's lots of ways I could have said it, but yeah, figurative sculpture, um, you know, and that can encompass uh, lots of other things. Uh, you know, I've done a little. Uh, uh, like wildlife, uh, nature, artwork, and things like that, but but it all kind of gets wrapped up in the figurative sculpture, I I guess. Okay. Um, the public art. So um, I've I've seen you um, involved in a few different public art projects, and, and yeah, the ones that I'm thinking of have figures in them. I'm thinking about. Um, You've done a few that have that uh, have the fire department involved, right? For yeah. for fire departments, and those all are figurative. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us how you got into that. How does that happen? Um, man, it was a long process. Um, in, in fact, in fact, if you remember, me and you applied for one once upon a time. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, went, and, and we went two different directions, right? I've yeah, done, well, so, yeah, I've done one public art project where I was the artist, but um, mostly I've been on the other side, the curatorial side. So here we have someone uh -huh. who's been on the, uh, the artist side. Yeah, so, um, it, you know, it, it took a while for me to get into. I, I thought once I started applying to these public commissions that, um, you know, my ideas, I was like, oh, this is a perfect idea. I'm going to get this one. But it really took me, I don't know, I, I probably... It took me four years of applying to public art projects before I even got one. And that was a small one. Um, it was uh, for $4,000 for a library in Colville, Utah. And I did an abstract piece. It's good to be able to respond to the location. But at the same time, um, you need to have some sort of a, a style. Um, Otherwise, the, the commissioning agency says, well, I don't even know what this person does. 
Mm. Uh, we, I, I can't even see what, you know, they can't even imagine what you would do if you are too spread thin with your styles. Um, so eventually I decided to start doing um, figurative sculpture and I would only apply for the calls that I thought fit that. Um, because there's lots of calls out there, yeah. um, you know, for, for hanging sculptures, light sculptures, um, interactive uh, sculptures, uh, ones that are uh, kinetic, all sorts of different things I could have gone into. Um, and, and like I said, at, at the beginning, I was, do, I was leaning more toward abstract, um, just because that was where my mind was going. But I realized I really, really loved sculpting figures. Um, so I kind of just had to, to put all these other great calls that I wanted to apply for aside um, and just say, if it's not figurative sculpture, I'm not going to apply for it. I'm not even going to uh, waste my time on that. So um, I started applying for those and that was a, that was a tough thing to get into because I'm, I'm applying and uh, in competition with people who have been you know, doing this for a lifetime and they have tons and tons of life size or monumental size bronze sculptures under their belt. Um, and a lot of them are really good. Um, and so I, I wasn't getting any of them. Um, so that's, in fact, a, that's a big, uh, uh, capital investment, right. To get into bronzing full size. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really expensive. So it wasn't something I could just feel good about making a life-size sculpture and then going and getting it bronzed. In yeah, fact, the right. first time I got stuff bronzed, I took out a loan. I, I, <laughs> I mean, I wasn't really a loan. It was just on my credit card. But yeah. I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy this stuff. Even though I don't have the money, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some stuff bronzed. And it took me some time to get, make that money back. Um, from those bronzes, but I, you know, it happened eventually. I'm not necessarily recommending doing that, but. Yeah. Where's uh, the foundry that you use, by the way? Which foundry? Uh, um, I, I've used a few, or I, I guess a couple in uh, Utah. Okay. There isn't really one around, around me. There's, there's one that makes like doorknobs and stuff, but um, not wanting to take my sculpture there and try to. Yeah. And they, they're not very interested in doing that anyway. Um, but there, there's quite a few in Utah. And um, so I, I've used a couple of them there. Okay. Um, what was I saying? Oh, so, uh, <laughs> so life size. I, I felt like I have never done a full figure, life size figure. And none of these calls that are wanting a full life size figure are ever going to hire me to do one unless I've done a figure. Um, so yeah. So in fact, this piece right here that you see in the background right there, um, I was doing an, an artist residency and I decided to, to sculpt that piece. Um, I actually just contacted different companies and said, Hey, I'm going to be using a lot of clay. Um, and I'm doing this artist residency. Can I, will you give me some clay? <laughs> and there were, there, there were some companies who just sent me a bunch of clay even, and they sent extra things like tools and all this stuff. And I, I didn't have to even pay for it, which was pretty awesome because that, that clay I used is, is uh, quite pricey as well. It's plastiline. Um, and I'm, so, you know, well, see, I that, so um, tell us about that clay. Um, plastiline. It, it's, it, it's an oil based clay. Um, so, you know, um, it doesn't dry out. I guess, I guess that's the, the big benefit. It doesn't dry out. Um, I, can, I can create armatures that are a lot more complex. And because the clay isn't shrinking like, like a water-based clay or a ceramic clay that you put in the kiln, um, this clay, you can put it, you know, say an arm is sticking way out like this. If I were to do that in ceramic, there's a good chance that arm is going to break off it's going to be hard to hold up because the weight keeps pulling it down, um, all sorts of things. But I can create a, a, a welded steel armature, the, the structure inside, and then put the clay on over that. Um, and I don't have to worry about all of those other things. The, the process of finishing it is a lot different. 
Um, so I'm going to be making a rubber mold and casting it in something. So this piece here, I created, it's a big mold, the biggest mold I've ever personally made. Um, and I cast that one in fiberglass. So I was able to say, hey, here's a life-size figure I did. Um, there, there were some other projects I did just, just for free. Um, <laughs> in order to get, to, to say I have some public pieces, I, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. So I did a, a bust of John F. Shelley. Um, okay. He's the founder of Shelley, Idaho. And I went to city council here in Shelley and I said, I want to give this to you. I want you to put it on a pedestal in your city council room. And they go, okay. So now it's on display there permanently in the city council room. Um, and I just did that in ceramic. I painted it to look like bronze. Um, I, don't, I never say it's bronze or anything, but, but uh, I mean, it looks fancy. Mm -hmm. And I can say that's a public piece I've done. I keep thinking of uh, a word that another artist that I uh, interviewed was using, and it's tenacious. Mm -hmm. And I think you're giving a good example again, where tenacity is really important for an artist. The fact that you just made those sculptures, gave them to uh, you know the city, basically. I love that. I, I love that. It's important to understand. Um, it's really hard work um, to be an artist, and um, you know my opinion is it's something. If you really want to do it, you can make it happen. There's so many different ways to, if you want to be an artist to become an artist. But one of those ingredients that's really essential is something like tenacity and hard work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you gotta, you got to make your own opportunities cause, because starting out, nobody's going to come to you and say, hey, we want to pay you all this money to do this. The thing is, I, I will be getting paid just down the line. I, I'm, I'm, prepare, I'm preparing these in order to get paid later, if that makes sense. Oh, uh, total sense. Yeah, yeah. It's, never, it's never like a one-to-one -one correspondence. You never know, you know where the, uh, the, uh, the paycheck or the opportunity is going to come from. You just have to keep doing your thing. Yeah, yeah. So... Well, I've got another question for you, Daniel, not to uh, cut that direction short, but um, the, okay. so back to the, the public art project, um, what does it look like then? So you apply, the committee selects you to do the work, and then from there, um, I'm curious about the interface with that committee and with the community, maybe, that you're making the public art for? What does that look like? Uh, meeting with them or do they, do they have input on what you're creating? Tell us about that. Uh, it's, it's gonna depend a lot on the project and what the committee is wanting to do. Um, there, there's two basic ways that a call starts out, which is an RFP and an RFQ. The RFP is a request for proposals and the RFQ is a request for um, qualifications. And then the committee will go through and choose from a few artists instead of tons with an RFP. Yeah. Um, what, once it gets to that point, um, you know, some of them are wanting a lot of interaction with you. Um, they really want you to respond to the site that it's going. They want you to respond to the community that this piece is going in. Um, others are just like, hey, you know, we chose you, now you make the piece. Uh, it, it really just depends. So I've done, you know, a, a pretty big range, I, I think. I've done it to where they pick me and then I make the piece and then I install it to um, a piece I did for uh, Ashton, Idaho, where I went and I did a, a community engagement program where people from the community came and sculpted these small little sculptures. Hmm. And then I took those pieces and I, I incorporated them into my larger piece. So, so now it's in their park. They can go for years now and go, ah, I made that part of this sculpture. You know, so it's really um, a lot of community engagement and involvement there. Mm -hmm. um, but really that's, it really just depends on what the community or the, the committee's vision was, mm -hmm. um, what they're wanting, if they want to deal with, with that type of involvement or not. So. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Hey, one last question for you. So, okay. um, can you share, um, you know, 
and I'm, I'm, you're on this, you're, uh, I, I haven't warned you about this, but uh, your favorite experience with art, maybe it was a public art project, maybe it was an artwork you made, maybe it was a, a collaboration or something. I'll tell you what, it doesn't have to be your favorite because that's not fair, but share a <laughs> memorable one. How about that? Share a memorable experience with art. Yes. Um, you know, I, I mean, that, I absolutely love to um, do public art and create art, but really a lot of that, those good times are just me alone in my studio working, mm -hmm. which doesn't sound very memorable. So I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to kind of go toward uh, teaching. Okay. So, um, so I also, I'm a teacher. I teach public school right now. I'm, I'm just, well, I'm trying to decide on when I want to go full time with my sculpture or not. I don't know. Um, I'm kind of getting to that point, but I, I'm still teaching because I haven't felt good about leaving. Um, there was a piece I did of a firefighter and a police officer um, for Cedar Park, Texas. Hmm. And uh, that, was, that was a ways away. Um, I, I tried to contact some sculptors I knew of around that area to help me install it because, I mean, those pieces are heavy. Um, it, it's just a lot of manual labor in order to do that. So I was able to get one sculptor, but he was kind of an older guy. I wasn't um, positive how much he'd be able to help, um, but he was going to come and help me with it. Um, but I was able to, to get a student of mine who had just graduated um, to come with me. And so we drove across the country. I mean, it was, it was all day long driving, two days straight. Just all we did was drive. <laughs> <laughs> and and we got there and we we installed it and the experience that he was able to have and um just me with it i don't know it was just a really good experience kind of being able to mentor him um in in doing that process and, and he was able to get all more excited about his art he was already really into art but um it was just a good experience to to have a young budding artist along for the ride as I, as I was able to do that. Nice. All right. Well, Daniel, thanks for spending some time with us, telling us about your artwork. Um, I hope, I hope you um, achieve everything you want to achieve with it. So thanks for being with us. <laughs> Any party Thank words? Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, art is amazing, and I think it can enhance anybody's life, no, no matter what you end up doing. I mean, I know this is art appreciation, and a lot of you probably aren't going to decide to to be a, a professional artist after um, listening to this interview or anything. But oh, sure, they art can... all of them are going to. Oh, they are. <laughs> okay, yeah, they I will. <laughs> um, but art will enhance and make your quality of life better, no matter what you end up doing. Um, I, I, I apply for a lot of these projects and I see the quality of life that, that some of these towns are trying to create by, by commissioning public art is just, I just see the effect this public art has on the community, on the economy, on all of this stuff. And it's, it really is amazing. So that, that's, that's what I wanna say. Art is important. Great. Okay. Be well. You too. Thank you. All right.